Thanks very much. My name is Mark Clegg. Um, welcome to Mozart Was a Hustler 2, a session on the entrepreneurial musician. And um, I work at the University of Michigan along with my colleague Jonathan. We run the SMTD Excel department, which is our entrepreneurship program. I'm also joined by Robin Quinnett, who is an entrepreneur violinist and um, runs a music school. So we'll be talking a lot about that. But I wanted to start out, how many of you in the audience have gone to music school or are going to music school? Is it, is it a good number of you? For those of you who didn't, you're gonna have to sort of take me, join me on a little bit of imagination here and maybe go back to your freshman year. Maybe for some, some of you are actually going forward if you're in high school or if you're just applying to school. But I wanna take you to, to one of the highlights of your collegiate career. Um, you're in a lecture hall with 150 or so of your closest friends um, in your favorite class of all time. It's at your favorite time of day, Monday morning, 8.30. <laughs> um, and you are in Music History 101. And uh, you're learning about Mozart. And you're, in, you're sort of, let's see, how would you describe your feelings? Um, enraptured, maybe? <laughs> Yeah, I see, I see the recognition on all of your faces. Just transformed, just completely enjoying the flow of memorization, starting to build in your brain. You're gonna have all of this information about when Mozart was born and when he died and all of the things he did and all the amazing music he wrote. And uh, maybe you're feeling a little bit sleepy. The lights are dim. Yeah, I've seen even more recognition now, that's good. And uh, you know, what, is your, what does your instructor say but, you know, Time for a pop quiz. So if you take out your handout at the very top, the very first blank, we're asking you to um, join us in a little participatory exercise about the kind of myths or ideas we learned in that music history class. So, so sort of who was Mozart and how did he make a living? So that's, that's what I want you to, to just write down a few notes there under number one. It's worth 100 points. Aaron will be passing out rewards for, for those of you who get A-plus on this question. Try not to remember you're in an entrepreneurship session. You're, you're actually in Musicology 101. So you, what did you come up with? What, why do we talk about Mozart in, our, in the storytelling we do about classical music? Very good. So I think you're taking Musicology 550, which is the advanced graduate seminar. <laughs> okay, well you cheated. You waited way too much stuff. But yeah, he's at this very important time of transition in the music industry when we're moving from one economic model to a new economic model, an economic model of patronage of the court, of the church, into a middle class market where consumers are buying music. We might think of that as analogous to today, of a time of transition in the economy of music, where we're going from one thing we used to know, big companies, recordings, things like that, to maybe a more do-it-yourself entrepreneurial market. We've got, got some, an answer over here, too. Yeah. Performing, composing, teaching. Excellent, yeah, so he's doing lots of different things. He, he was a hustler, as we're gonna be talking about. But my guess is that this didn't come up in your Music History 101 class, am I right? What, ca what came up in your Music History 101 class? Do you remember? Yeah. You didn't know, yeah, he did teach. Yeah, he, t he taught students. It was actually a really good gig, particularly in Vienna. If, if the emperor gave you a, a royal student, then everybody wanted to study with you, right? But the reason we studied Mozart in history, at least in my music history class, was that he was a genius, right? He was at the top. He was at the, the height of Mount Olympus of what it meant to be an artist. And we all wanted to be, in a sense, Mozart. We wanted to be at the absolute top of the mountain. And this genius was reflected in his music, right? So we talked about Mozart as a composer, right? We didn't talk about Mozart as a hustler. 
Mozart as a teacher, Mozart as a freelancer, Mozart as a person who put together um, concerts. So when we look at all of the things Mozart did, of course he composed and published music, but he also wrote pop arrangements of his tunes, right? So if you put out an opera, one of the first things you did is you cranked out all these pop arrangements for easy piano or string quartet to make sure that people, that you were buying it and no one stole it from you. So he was writing pop arrangements, he was concertizing, not only doing, again, the things at the top of the winner circle, the big you know, champions of the competition doing the concertos, but he was also behind the scenes organizing the concerts, selling tickets, doing the marketing, he's, he's freelancing, he's conducting, he's doing a little bit of everything, right? He did competitions, he did um, concert production, he taught lessons, right? He toured, he, he studied and researched the music of Haydn and said, hey, this Haydn guy made a lot of money writing uh, opus of string quartets, I'm gonna write a set of string quartets too and I'm gonna dedicate it to Haydn so all the folks who bought the Haydn volume and love that are gonna think, who's this Mozart guy? I have no idea, but you know, I like Haydn, so I'm gonna, maybe I'll try this, right? So he, he knew how to leverage celebrity endorsements, <laughs> right? He had government patronage, he had, had a sort of a day job in a sense at certain times, right? So the big point is that he was a hustler, right? And so when we put someone like Mozart at the top of Mount Olympus as a model to our young musicians, to not only you, but the people you're, you're now teaching, and we say, be like Mozart, we have to do this in 3D. We can't just look at him in the one dimension of genius composer, because that will seem unattainable, right? A couple of us, maybe we'll get to that point. Maybe we'll win Concert Master of the New York Philharmonic. Maybe we'll be the next Pulitzer Prize winner, right? A couple of us will get there. But everybody else who's writing pop arrangements and organizing their own concerts and who's teaching lessons will feel like they failed. And my point is, if you're like Mozart, you're a winner. And Mozart taught lessons, and Mozart organized his own concerts, and Mozart did his own marketing. So if you wanna be like Mozart, you gotta do those things too. You gotta be a hustler, right? And so this is the normal, traditional way that the greatest musicians in history have made it happen. This is not something that's the backup plan that, oh, you know, I, I've been out on the audition circle for two, for two months and I haven't won my big gig, so I guess I gotta go to plan B. So Mozart's plan A. So what we're gonna do is learn from some of our colleagues here on sort of how this plan A works. And, you know, again, this is, there's, there's lots of great models. The one thing I did wanna say is that there's some things about Mozart that you don't wanna do. Um, one of the things is you want to be a lot better money manager than Mozart. So everybody knows he died in a pauper's grave and he was poor, right? He wasn't poor because he wouldn't have cash flow. He was poor because he couldn't hold on to it as it went through his fingers, right? So um, do not leverage yourself by borrowing to pay your rent if you can avoid it and really manage your money well. So that may come up in our conversation as well. But you know, if you're like Mozart, you'll have what we call in the entrepreneurship biz the portfolio career. Right? So the idea is you have many different streams of income that get you towards a satisfying, fulfilling life. Okay? If you want to be like Mozart, if you look at the Mozart myth from Musicology 101, you're just going to see one arm to this portfolio career, genius composer. Right? If you look at the real Mozart, you're going to see that he was hustling. He was teaching. He was administering. He was writing and composing and arranging and publishing his stuff. Right? Doing all the things that we think, you know, if we do now, maybe we can be like Mozart. Right? But he was thinking of himself in, as a multi-dimensional businessman, not just as a genius composer. Right? So one of the problems here is that you can look at yourself as, well, this is going to dilute my excellence. Like, we're all about being amazing. We're, we want to be that genius of our violin or of a composer, a genius conductor. Right? That's, that's as John Kieser was talking about this morning about the New York Symphony, that's sort of the the price of admission. You gotta be great at what you do. You gotta have something to say and the ability to say it. But once you do that, you, it's not about just cheapening your art and doing too many things and diluting what you can do. It's about pulling it all together. Being Yo-Yo Ma. Right? Doing a bunch of different things. He founded his own ensemble. He's created his own arrangements. Right? He's, what does he have, like 90 CDs out or something? 90 recordings? He's teaching lessons too. He's running his own summer camp. Right, for how to do the thing he's passionate about, which is bringing different musics together, and it saturates every piece of his 
of his puzzle. So that's my sort of shift here from portfolio career to the purposeful career, right? You find what brings you joy and you bring that purpose to everything you do. We had a visitor at the University of Michigan a couple weeks ago, Jade Simmons, who came out and she's doing it all, but she's very much driven by this purpose. She was a concert pianist doing the you know, Van Cliburn thing. And she found when she was giving recitals that afterwards when she was talking to people in the lobby, they were just energized. They wanted to take on the world, that she had not just played a great concert for them, but that they were inspired to take on maybe some challenge that they had never realized you know, that they would have the courage to do because they found her story so inspiring. And so rather than say, gee, this is a drag, I, I play list and they're not like impressed by my runs and my super virtuosity, they're inspired to do something in their own life. The light bulb went on in her head and she said, well, maybe if I'm inspiring people, maybe that's my purpose. So I'm gonna give talks and I'm gonna be a motivational speaker, I'm gonna write books and I'm gonna have a blog and I'm gonna be a minister in my church and I'm gonna tell people about all of these ideas because that's my purpose and I can do the same thing through my piano. Right, so she found a way to make her piano the vehicle for this purpose, but is able to make money from this full range of activities. Right, so here we have Robin, Gwinnett, we wanted to bring her into the conversation, who I don't know how well I did in using your bio and picking out all the things you're doing. You probably even have more than that. But I wanted you to, to tell us a little bit about sort of how your career is scoped out and all the different activities that you do. Sure, absolutely, and uh, thank you for having me. I, I think even remotely being in, um, compared to Mozart is quite an honor. <laughs> so <laughs> um, I wrote down all of the things I do because it's, it's quite a few. Um, and so I'm based in New York City and I have in my performing aspect of my career, I have a serious string trio called the Milestone Trio. And um, I am a member of two different orchestras in the surrounding area and I perform regularly with several others. Um, I also am involved in chamber orchestras. I toured with the Sphinx Virtuosi. Um, I joined a chamber orchestra that a friend just started, uh, the Sullivan County Chamber Orchestra. I also give two recitals a year. So that is my performance aspect of my career. Um, in the education sector, um, I teach through a few nonprofit organizations, Opus 118 in New York City, No Pointer Foundation, um, I teach group violin classes. Uh, I have a private studio of my own, and I give community engagement concerts. And um, specifically, also with the Milestone Trio, uh, we design um, curriculum specific concerts and classroom follow ups so that we can take music into the classroom for other subjects. For example, um, literature and, um, and what else? Like history. And um, also, I myself am a DMA candidate at Stony Brook, so there's that as well. Um, I also teach online um, a course part-time for a college. And, um, and then in the entrepreneurial aspects of my career, um, I, can, I contract a small amount for um, little gigs. And then my passion project is um, the Montserrat Music Festival, which is a teaching and chamber music festival on the island where I'm originally from in the Caribbean called Montserrat. So that is the scope of what I do. So when you're doing all those different things, do they feel like they're part of one mission or does it feel like it's really more of an economic strategy for you? I, they're all related in some way. Um, I mean, definitely the performing is just, you know, um, it's satisfying, it's reaching the highest point of my craft that I can. Um, and then, of course, there's the teaching and the community engagement. I've always had this um, passion to, to give back and to kind of have young people realize their potential. So that's just, it's exhilarating for me. So, of course, the educational concerts, the teaching, um, the festival, those are all part of what uh, make me satisfied as an artist. Mm -hmm. And did, they, did these things develop sort of organically, or did you think, like, okay, I got to... I gotta I, expand my economic base. I gotta sort of approach this as a business person. Well, I couldn't have planned this better myself. Um, it all sort of happened. Um, of course, you have a plan. You know, you have to have goals that you're reaching toward. Um, one of those goals was getting into Juilliard, and I think a lot of things came out of just being there, meeting people that I now play with um, in all aspects. 
of my career, um, uh, I remember the, my teacher, the late Stephen Clapp, um, asked me to lead a scale class for his um, incoming students, and that was um, interesting for me, and I really loved it, and I was thinking, I could do this. I could really be teaching um, a lot more, and uh, then getting recommendations from, uh, from people when I was teaching at certain organizations, they would recommend me for other things, and so it became this sort of snowball effect of um, taking these new opportunities that I wasn't sure what would happen, mm -hmm. but I knew that it was at least exciting, so I was willing to try it out. Well, I, I'm excited to hear you use the word love. I love that, and that's why I started teaching. It wasn't the backup plan. It was something that you found deeply satisfying. Absolutely. So, Jonathan, let's uh, talk about your, your career. I think we got another slide here. If I can get to it. It'll come up with, with at least my guesstimate at your portfolio career. So how, how have you put together, and what kind of range of activities do you do? Sure. Well, um, I have the pleasure of working with you in the Excel program at the University of Michigan. And so um, in my role as assistant director there, I oversee the programming, um, primarily the co-curricular programming that we have. So that's career coaching for our students. It's a series of workshops and other guest events, like Jade Simmons and then many others. Um, and the distribution of our uh, student support funding for projects and ventures. And so I think I also teach in the program. So I think most people would probably, who know me there, would say, you know, they see me as an arts administrator and as an educator, um, which is true. But I'm also a pianist, uh, been a piano pedagogue, um, an arts entrepreneur, um, and I've done some researching and writing as well. So I think about the portfolio career as sort of an evolving thing. If you imagine, for example, those different pieces of the pie, they can become larger or smaller over time. And hopefully, they grow or shrink based on your goals and intent, I think, rather than just happenstance. Um, and so, you know, I would say that the bulk of my work today is invested in the, in the program um, at Michigan. Um, but I also continue to perform. I just have completed a CD with my duo partner, um, who also happens to be my wife, Paula Savidu, uh, where we have a duo called the New Muse Piano Duo that spun off, actually, of a new music ensemble that I formed, a professional ensemble I formed as a graduate student um, at the University of Wisconsin um, that was dedicated to taking new music into unconventional venues with a sort of collective model um, mm -hmm. of musicians. So, yeah, so that's been something that has been kind of at different points in my life, larger and or smaller as in terms of the economic pie, but in terms of the impact and the sort of uh, personal satisfaction and aesthetic um, impact that I hope to make in my life a big piece of it. So you also have an MBA, right? So yes. did you, was this construct of this portfolio career, was this a strategy or did it sort of, how did it happen? Was it, was it something you just sort of followed the things you enjoyed doing or were you thinking like MBA 101, I gotta make this happen? Well, it's, I mean, I would say, I wish I could say that, well, because I had this sort of master's in performance, uh, piano performance degree and also an MBA that it was just the perfect match, but you know, I was graduating with my, uh, getting close to graduation with my master's in piano and I was applying for jobs and I thought, you know, I'm so qualified going to be easy. You know, give me an arts management position. It's in Milwaukee. I don't know anything about it. I'm going to put my hat in the ring. Why not? I mean, how many other people could be that qualified, right? So after about 35, 36 applications and getting crickets, I, re I realized that, you know, that my world was, my worldview was very sort of misaligned because I wasn't really building as many relationships as I should. And I wasn't really getting to know the world of arts management, for example, in a hands-on way. And so, you know, I, I think there were some stumbling blocks for me early on, but there was a moment when I realized that, um, and this is, by the way, through a course correction, through seeking mentorship from people. I was part of a group called Arts Enterprise that started about 10 years ago at the University of Michigan. Um, and through mentorship relationships that I cultivated, based on good advice that I should be going out there and connecting with people, I started to realize that um, you know, if I change my orientation from just being as sort of successful as I could as a pianist to having the most impact that, that I could deliver through my art making and through the skills that I have collectively, um, that that might be a more viable path. And so at that point, you know, that's when I started an ensemble and I got involved with Arts Enterprise and started to really get invested in relationships in the community. And then it became more of a strategy, but it took a while. And I'd say that now all of these activities for me are basically geared towards one goal, which is to help artists self-start careers. Mm -hmm. And so for example, as a pianist, I'm a new music pianist, so I commission and champion works by emergent composers and young artists. Um, and that's, you know, for example, the works that are on the CD um, that I've uh, just released. And so I feel like it, over time it has grown into sort of a more focused mission. 
Um, and that's one thing that it, through the Excel program we try to instill with our students is that the earlier that you can start to think about the why behind what you're doing mm -hmm. and the, the impact that you hope to achieve through that work, not only the more successful you'll be, the, but the more in, you know, enriched your life will become and probably the more traction you'll find with, in terms of finding support for the projects that you mm -hmm. are passionate about. That's great. So Robert, you're just finishing up a DMA, right? Yes. So, um, you know, wh what for you are you finding to be the biggest challenge? I'm going to ask this to both of you. We'll start with Robin about just what it, what living the life of the the hustling musician. I mean, what what are the hurdles? I mean, I think a lot of people can relate. Um, the the biggest challenge for me is time management between the different um, aspects of my career. Making sure you still have time to keep your chops up. Um, you're not overbooking with too many students um, and you're not prepared for your performance or you reschedule students or um, and then you don't see them for a while or um, if I'm if I'm not working on the Montserrat Music Festival nothing is happening so I need to be reaching out to people I need to be keeping the communication lines open and planning so um, time management really I think that's the biggest challenge that's great what about you for you Jonathan well I mean I think it's uh, I would totally agree with that. <laughs> I think that everybody, um, one way or another, can probably relate to that. I, I'd say that for me, it's probably also a matter of um, sort of focus on sort of personal trajectory and staying. There was a great uh, mention by Angie Duro, who I see uh, sitting down here in the previous session about grit, um, and the whole panel was discussing it. In, in fact, and that has stuck with me because I think so. For example, I had two years after my my graduate degree when I thought I was so viable and I just wasn't getting opportunities. And um, and I think, you know, so as I, I was freelancing essentially to try to kind of put the pieces together. And there, is, there were just so many moments of feeling like, why, why did I invest in these things? Because it doesn't seem like I'm making the progress that I wish I had. And so maintaining that kind of grit and resiliency in terms of your own uh, forward trajectory mm -hmm. when you don't get the validation that you expect to have, that you may have received all the way through your training, um, was is probably the biggest challenge I think, and it's ongoing because when we're launching new programs, I feel the same thing. Even though it's you know it's a privileged position, we have great opportunities, great resources, but things don't always work out the way you want them to. Yeah. Um, and so finding uh, that that kind of grit over time, and this is something actually I think we can relate to Mozart with. I was just thinking it was reminding me of of a, a certain child prodigy <laughs> who was taken all around Europe as a superstar, yeah. and then basically he got older, and he was yeah. no longer the five-year-old kid impressing the queen. Yeah. He was just a typical court musician stuck in Salzburg, right? So so I know you I know as a pianist you have yeah. known a lot about Mozart. So what did Mozart well, do about that? Well, I know a little bit. <laughs> I know something that might be relevant to this uh, this uh, talk. I mean, so basically in about 1773 when he sort of finished his tours, he came back to Salzburg and had this appointment as assistant concertmaster under the archbishop there, which is a pretty stable gig. Um, and he was okay with it for a while, but by 1778 he was getting restless, and this is when he went on this tour to Munich and Paris and Mannheim, and his, this is the story where his mother went with him because his father couldn't, wasn't released from his role, and she died on that trip, which was one of the big moments in his life, but also one of the beginnings of the of moments of friction between him and his father. And essentially, from that point on, he was determined to leave. He thought he had more potential. He didn't have a clear pathway to another job, but he was determined to do it. And so in 1781, he goes to Vienna and essentially starts freelancing before freelancing was sort of a, an established route. And it wasn't until 1784 that he really had a big success, a year where he played like 22 concerts, only five of which he was the featured soloist, by the way. So he was embedded in his community in a big way. And not until 1786, until his opera, The Marriage of Figaro, was, or was premiered and became this big career launch pad success. Um, so I thought about that and I realized, because I was teaching a course at some point, a short course on Mozart, I realized, wow, he spent eight years. Mozart, after becoming like the Justin Bieber of his time, <laughs> you know, this very successful child star, um, he struggled. Mm -hmm. And he had this kind of grit, he had to, he had to be so resilient, and he did concerts in restaurants and in alternative venues because guess what? Venues were expensive to rent, and he was self-producing these concerts mm -hmm. even then. Um, so anyway, that makes me feel a little bit better knowing that we all, you know, if it took us, you know, to me or the people that I talk with, two years, three years, four years, five years to start to gain traction, it took him much longer, even with all of the the, the reputation and the assets and the skills and the talents that he had. Um, so yeah, I think that's that's probably for me the biggest challenge ongoing. Yeah, that makes it a lot more relatable to maybe the situation we've been in. 
And that's, that's sort of the reason for this, having this idea of Mozart, is just to give us permission as musicians to hustle. We don't have to feel like this is something weird or something unusual. This is, again, is, is the typical path. So I have one more question for these guys, and then I'm going to open it up to you. So I just want you to start warming up for the questions you're going to ask. We have microphones on either side. So if you are interested, if you want to get in line, that'll, that'll mean we'll have the best use of time. So one of the things I think about the, the portfolio career, that picture I had of the, the guy playing tuba and bass drum at the same time, you know, is that it seems like maybe it's uh, the hustle is something that takes us off our game, that, that is, is just an economic strategy and is not personally fulfilling. So I'm wondering if you each can just respond to the question of, you know, since you've developed these careers over time, what is it that now motivates you to keep doing it? Is you know, is is there something fulfilling or something surprising that's a reward, sort of personally, emotionally, from doing this kind of work? Absolutely. I I have this burning sense of purpose. Um, for example, um, for my project in Montserrat, because I feel like I'm here for a reason, um, and to do this particular work. Um, it's a small place, not many people are from there. I'm very fortunate to have experienced Montserrat in its prime, and now it's experienced some um, natural devastation with the volcano coming back to life. And I've always had in the back of my mind that um, I wanted to start a project to give the same kind of opportunities um, to kids to realize their purpose and their potential um, through music and the arts. And that's, this is what keeps me going, and everything that I do um, whether it's performing, honing my own craft, whether it's um, teaching in the schools in New York City, whether it's my private students, um, it's all, it, it all gives me insight into how to manage this type of project that's really on my mind at all times. So um, I think having a, a purpose, having some, some really overarching goal um, is what keeps it all in perspective for me. So you might take a, you might take a gig or two that is um, is maybe less fulfilling, but it pays pretty well, or or other way around where it, you know, it doesn't pay as well, but it's very fulfilling, um, and it all evens out. I think as long as you keep on that trajectory, at least for myself, I've found that um, I, I still feel that sense of purpose and that I'm doing all right. So fantastic. Yeah, I would just second that. I mean, I think you're such a role model, um, and also in the way you describe what you do, right? There's mm -hmm. a clear intention behind the decisions that you make and the work that you do. And I think when people see that, that that's um, that gives you fuel to try things. And so I guess that for me, it's um, this mind shift, which um, for me is all about creating rather than waiting. I think so many, especially the young the young artists, uh, you know, students or young professionals that I work with come in with problems because they see opportunity, they have opportunities in mind that they want, but they don't see access to them, mm -hmm. um, whether that's an orchestral job or a college teaching job or a grant or whatever it is. And it's so often that the, our possibilities are framed around existing opportunities. So we just wait long enough that we'll get them. And I don't think that this concept of greater resilience should be about that. I think it's exactly what you said, which is to find ways to deliver the value back to the communities you care about in an authentic way, in a way that you are leveraging both the things you're passionate about, but also the skills you have and your network. Um, and if you do that, and that's been a theme actually throughout the whole, the whole conference, I think, um, that if you start to create rather than waiting, that you're going to start to, that you're creating a value chain that's going to come back to you. And some of that value is going to be financial, but it might also be other types of currency, so social currency, cultural cur currency, and a greater network of people that are going to enrich your life. And I think whether you're a performer, teacher, or administrator, those, that's the, maybe the most critical resource that you can cultivate. And certainly Mozart did that mm -hmm. um, when he was in Vienna, but I think um, it's something we all need. Yeah, that, that passion, that meaning for us, I think, is what gets us involved in music and keeps us involved. And it sounds like you guys have managed to stay connected to that passion. Question. Good morning. My name is Emory Kidd. I'm an instructor of audio recording technology at Alabama State University and HBCU in Alabama. And um, my life in many ways is an example of the portfolio career as many musicians, educated musicians, soon find out that without having these different venues uh, to make money or different streams of income, um, you won't get your bills paid and it, it becomes necessity. Um, but there's one piece that I've observed that pretty much uh, makes or breaks our youth when it comes to people of color in America. 
um, on seeing themselves in particular venues. Um, and that's the research driven or research activities. Uh, my goal here is to create and record, I'm sorry, record the achievements of excellence of people of color and different things like that, uh, because we all here see it, we know. But what specific research, and I'm so sorry to go into one specific avenue, but what specific research activities um, do you think is good to document the achievements of uh, people of color to be able to put it in the educational system? Mm. Great question. Anybody want to tackle that? I mean, I think all achievements are valid in the arts. I mean, you you can definitely learn a lot from 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 the achievements of people of color. Um, I wouldn't limit it. I would say that um, if somebody's doing something great, you should you should certainly recognize it. Um, I'm not sure if I'm answering your question, like w what particular venues you're worried about documenting, but um, I would say everything. Yeah, I mean, I would channel um, a, a point from a, the previous session, uh, 9 a.m., Angelica Harrison made, talked about challenging the, sta the, the stats and specifically talked about what are the images, for example, thinking uh, as an organization, what are the images that you send forth about who your constituency is and what they do? And so thinking on those lines, I think one of the questions that is kind of related to your question is, so what are the kinds of roles that you want to illuminate? Where do you see, for example, a misrepresentation or underrepresentation of the work that's being done by people of color? And then, I mean, Rachel Barton Pine is a violinist who's had a project where she's been working to document um, basically un, like lost works by composers of color. Um, and, you know, the fact is when I saw a presentation, I all of a sudden had access to 60 or 70 or however many, you know, works that I had never heard of. I'd never seen in my library because, and my teacher had never spoken about. So to break that cycle, I think one of the things that you can do is to identify, so that's a very specific, you know, project. And so you might pick one project to start, you know, an area within the um, music industry that you see as severe underrepresentation that you want to focus on. And, um, you know, I, I would say that it's valid across, I would agree with Robin, it's across, valid across any, any discipline, but you can pick one that, seem, that you feel like you have a certain expertise in or you have access to resources to start doing that research. And then you, by documenting that one area, it can kind of create traction potentially to expand. Because I think also through that research, it's not just doing the research, but it's sharing with people. And quite often a focused project on a particular area will give you more access because there may be more defined pathways to do that through conferences or through research journals or through other other avenues. Um, I'd say, you know, certainly performing and composing and probably many other roles behind the scenes of the recording industry are very, um, you know, real ripe and ready to have um, more representation uncovered. So. Yeah, I'm, I'm thrilled to hear you're interested in telling those stories. I mean, that's again part, just to go back to our theme of most are always a hustler, that's, it impoverishes our ability to embrace this economic reality of, of being a living human musician if we only think of Mozart as the, the genius of history, right? As only the person at the pinnacle who was the great composer, and we don't think of him as the guy who was teaching lessons and the guy who was producing his own concerts, right? So the stories we tell about our past become the models for the future for all of us. I mean, it becomes the way we think about our world. And I think it's really important to tell the stories and really important to, you know, to celebrate different successes, you know? So our, the alumni magazines of our music schools need to celebrate the entrepreneurs, need to celebrate the yep. teachers, need to celebrate the people who are doing work in the communities as much as they celebrate the person who got the gig with the big major orchestra, right? And we t at least the tendency I see is to celebrate only the people that sort of have fit the, the myth rather than fit the reality, right? And there is, there is research, I mean, just to point it out, uh, about um, entrepreneurship and sort of the challenges in particular of people who are, don't have access to privilege, right? So if you, if you have privilege, if you, your family has money and has, you know, owns a house and has financial money in the bank and can get credit and all those things, you can, be, you can afford to, be, to take risk. You can afford to say, oh, I'm just gonna move to New York and I'm just gonna make it happen. And, and by the way, mom and dad are paying the rent, right? So if you're doing it on your own and you don't have those resources, or when you walk into a room, people look at you like, with skepticism rather than with sort of obvious expectation that you're gonna be amazing. 
um, you have to work that much harder and you have to have the, the psychological resilience, that grit that Angie talked about to, to sort of be courageous in that moment. And I think, again, if you can see that you're doing what Mozart did, if you're, if you're doing the tradition, if you're doing what it takes and, and being who you're supposed to be, hopefully you're a little bit stronger in that. So, next question. Hello, uh, my name is Javier Orman. I'm a violinist and composer with COSM, K-O-Z-M. That's not a radio station. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a violin and guitar band. Uh, we make our own music. So I play, I write, I tour, I record, like you guys, I teach. Um, and you know, I've been doing that for years and I've always had trouble doing all of that and sleeping well and eating well and exercising and taking care of myself. So my question is, how do you manage yourself? We don't sleep. <laughs> so no, oh yeah, me neither. Um, uh, you learn as you go. I'm sure you, you know, there's, there's ups and downs. Um, I know that um, we were talking about uh, Mozart earlier and how that teaching portion of his career was something he sort of suffered through. And it was, it's not for everybody to, to have so many different um, venues of uh, taking up your time. Uh, but I would say just to, what helps me is planning ahead, um, writing everything down. If I don't write it down, it's not real. It doesn't happen for me. Um, and then, and do, do value your own time to take time for yourself. It's, it's so important. I'm sure you can expand on that too. Yeah, I would agree. No, I think, I think just going off that, that point, um, you, to, developing a very, a, a very structured system around organization for your own time uh, is very important. I also think that it's, it's relatively impossible for most people to be full charge forward on eight different paths all at once. And so for me, I've always, I, my personal approach has always been that, you know, first and foremost, figuring out this one, if I, if I know that all these activities are directed towards one goal, if I find an opportunity on one of those paths, that feels good and that is, is fulfilling and could be sort of a stable financial base for a period, then I, I've generally been willing to go on that path, even that, if that role might be more educational or more administrative and less performance, for example. Um, but then I think it's, it's sort of like the one plus three. You know, you have one primary focus and then two or three other things that you're working on sustaining. Like with the CD, it's a three year project, you know. Um, and I'm not, I would be lying if I said, oh yeah, you know, I practice three hours a day and I play concerts every single week. It's, it's not possible to do that. Um, but there are other ways to maintain those other activities within the, the sort of spectrum of activities that I'm pursuing. And so I think it's constantly evaluating and adjusting and having a strategy and a long-term set of goals for where you want to be in two years or three years or five years. And even if that means you put something on the back burner, if that's a passion project or piece of your life you don't want to give up, find a way to sustain it even in a smaller um, way for that time being. Um, so thinking about it in terms of projects, I guess, is what I'm saying is yeah. really, really helpful. I love your question, Javier, in part because uh, I think the health, the personal health issue is huge. And uh, I just want to give a pitch for uh, one of my new instructors at the Excel program at the University of Michigan, uh, Professor Aaron Dworkin, <laughs> who's just sitting over there. But uh, Aaron, um, I've learned a lot just by watching Aaron, but he actually has a video series now called Aaron Asks. And a lot of what he talks about is sort of, you know, basic habits that you can come into about sort of eating and exercise that help him get what he gets done done. So I think the tendency, especially when you're young, and you know, I'm not you know, so young anymore, so I can't take it for granted. But when you're, when I was 20, I certainly didn't worry about exercise so much. I didn't, you know, it just seemed to be okay. And uh, but I think that there's a huge psychological benefit to just taking care of yourself health-wise. And if you can exercise and, and eat well, you will be more resilient, you will be less depressed, you'll be more optimistic. And so I really appreciate you bringing that to our attention because we shouldn't forget that. Next question. Hello, my name is Kai Wright. I'm a kind of freelance violist in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. And one thing I wanted to ask is the one part about Mozart you said not to emulate was definitely his money management. And when I think there's a lot of us in here probably who grew up more in the working poor demographic. And so how do you balance like making sure that you have a steady paycheck, that you can pay your bills and everything while also jumping in and taking risks? Because I think that's a very real like fear and insecurity, um, especially among artists. Mm -hmm. Fantastic question. 
Um, well, I, that's a, yeah, that is a great question. I think um, it, it comes also back to the concept of planning. And one general rule of thumb, I mentioned it yesterday, but I think it's um, relevant here, is this idea of a budget for yourself that is not, it's not just what's the money coming in, the money coming out. You need to be able to track your cash flow. This is what's your priorities, right? So there's this idea of the 50, 20, 30 rule. So if you can keep your fixed expenses, things like rent, utilities, groceries, the things that you know you need, and they're pretty much predictable, under 50% of your take home income, um, and then invest at least 20% of your take home income into financial priorities, whether that's paying down debt or putting away an emergency fund, or it could be putting, setting aside money for a particular project, right? Like an album or a tour or something. Um, that's good. And then you have 30% left, right? And that 30% is sort of your flexible spending. Those are things that, you know, are lifestyle choices, eating out, doing fun things, your entertainment uh, choices, those kinds of things. You keep that under 30%, you have 100%, right? And so thinking about the money that you take home in that way gives you more agency. Because it's, you may say, well, what if I'm spending 30% just to pay my, my debt down? Or what if I have a lot more, I don't have enough income? Well, if you know that you need to keep to that ratio, you can either try to cut down in some small ways that extra flexible spending money, or if you can't, you, you can then look to generate more income through a new activity, right? That might increase your total income so your ratios sort of stay equal. I mean, it's not a simple solution, obviously, and I can relate to the, the, the fact of being a hustling freelance artist and trying to make my bills every month. But having a system like that allowed me to feel like I was in control of the decisions I made about which projects I took on, and it helped me then understand exactly how much money I needed because maybe there were certain things I could become a little more efficient on in my own spending to create more space to invest in myself. And I think it's important to do that while not giving up the, the priorities of things like paying down debt, which is a huge, we know that's one, maybe the number one reason that artists leave the field is that they don't feel financially secure, and that's directly related to the increased cost of education and debt, so. So I'd, I'd just point out two things. One is that for both Jonathan and um, Robin, they're, they have sort of anchor gigs Right? They have, in a sense, a day job that provides a yeah. steady income with Jonathan at the University of Michigan. Well, with you in the DMA, right, you want to get a, a faculty position, hopefully, you know, that'll provide a pretty steady, stable center that, that your Montserrat Festival can then spin out from, right? Mm -hmm. So that's one strategy. But I think the other thing, Daniel Romain is talking later today, and I learned some really important things from him, and, and it's sort of in your handout, I said, I think I said you incorporated there in the, in the circle at the bottom with the portfolio career. It's, it's just a mental shift to think of yourself as a business, right? And a business has cash flow and it has debt and it has, but it also has investments and opportunity. And one of the things I remember Daniel saying, when I talked to him about this a long time ago, was that you know, he, he got a rent in an apartment in New York that was much less than he could have afforded. He could have gotten a nicer place, right? But he wanted to live lean so that he would have that working capital to experiment with, to, to be able to do a project, and if he needed to, to self-fund it, he could do that a little bit. But you, so don't don't spend everything on your living expenses. That that 50, 30, 20 rule only works if you keep the living to to, to 50 percent, right? So you you got to be careful, and that's what Mozart didn't do, right? He he kept his living at 150 percent because he wanted to be as, just as good as all the royal patrons he'd been hanging out with, have the, the beautiful sheets and the beautiful apartment and the penthouse and all that. So he overspent, and then that made made his enterprise, in a sense, ultimately fail financially. Artistically, it was a winner, but financially, it wasn't. So um, we have, unfortunately, just run out of time. But we're going to do some consulting and stick around. We'll be happy to talk to you. Just join me in really thanking our two panelists, Jonathan and Robin. Fantastic. They're an inspiration. And thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of the conference.